Hey, Oscar. Hey, James. UK, great. Yeah, you guys give a shout out when you log in. Tell me where um, where you're you're from. Hey, Brad. Hey, Y A Y A O G. Ken, Bill, Atlanta, great. Hello, Bosnia, New York. You guys, since you're the first ones here, tell me uh, if the sound is okay. I'm still experimenting, trying to get the best settings, and you know, and that kind of thing. Hopefully, the video quality will be a little bit better this time. Oklahoma. Hey, Jane. Jonathan. Kenny, you're here so I can get started. Perfect. Good. All good. Great. Sounds great. Hey, Ben from Ireland. Okay, cool. Well, this is the second uh, live stream that I've tried. Uh, again, I'm, I'm just trying to give this a try to make sure this is even doable or fun or informative, because if it's not, then there's no point in doing it. <laughs> so um, I really appreciate you guys signing in and uh, joining me today. Um, the questions are unlimited. Whatever you guys want to know in pertaining, in pertaining to video or sound or audio or quads or life, happiness, anything you guys want to know. So go ahead and fire away. Yeah, the mic is in better focus. I, I need to think about a better camera for this kind of stuff. <clears throat> the new audio plugins in Premiere are great. They're fantastic. I'm glad they finally stepped it up a little bit. Uh, for screen recording, I'm using the OBS uh, app that's free that YouTube recommends. So far, it seems to work pretty good. Let's see. Shot types for cyclists. I'm assuming that you're talking about bicyc uh, bicycling or motorcycling. Usually, any of those kind of shots, the best thing I would do is uh, any kind of follow me mode. You know, any anything that could track your motion and, and follow along with you. And usually, the closer the better. The more dynamic the shot, the better. Hey Portugal. Hey Pedro. New at editing, best program, Final Cut Pro. Ken, Final Cut Pro is a, is a great application. It really is. I, I used to be a diehard Final Cut user, and um, I, I switched over when when uh, Final Cut uh, came out with Final Cut 10 because I just felt like uh, Premiere Pro had some some better, easier to use features. Final Cut 10 was pretty clunky when it first came out, but you know, there's nothing wrong at all with Final Cut 10. The, uh, if you're starting editing with that, that'll be great. Let's see. What's the toughest, most challenging shot you've ever gotten? And is it online? Thanks. The toughest, most challenging shot I ever got. It's not online, but um, the toughest shots I've got when, were when I hired uh, a company called Visual Poet Studios to do uh, some shots at a theme park. And because of safety, we had to be really careful on uh, when we had to go flying over people and things like that. But by the same token, you want some really dynamic shots that get fairly close to the rides. Uh, so that one was tricky because, you, you know, you want to get something close to rides, but at the same time be as safe as possible with uh, the, 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 uh, the people around. And, and yikes, the, you always have to factor in if something happens, if that, if that uh, quad or octo falls, where is it going to fall? So... All right. Brad, my number one question is setup and scripting for shots, especially drone shots. Do you have a script beforehand or shoot what what you can write and write around and what is shot? Brad, that's a tough question because uh, usually when, when I go out, I have a video in mind. So th there's a rough script in my head. Um, but but the first thing, it's all, you know, the story is the most important thing. So, yeah, sitting down with a pa piece of paper and even a rough script making out you know pointing out your your bullet points your highlights what you're going to cover that's what you've got to do otherwise you're kind of shooting in the dark you know uh, so usually when I go out I make a rough script of what I need to do for what I need to say what I need to capture and then I kind of go from there and then I get back in the studio see the footage that I have and then script it back out again um, and to fill out any gaps and anything I miss. But yeah, a script is, is of primary importance. Otherwise, you, you don't really have a, um, a guide to go by for when you're shooting footage for a video. I hope that answers the question. 
Kenny, I know you have mastered the video tools you're currently used, but uh, can I twist your arm to pick up Resolve and give us tutorials? Kenny, I would love to. It's just that I, I had such limited time. I know that Resolve is a fantastic program, especially with color. Um, but uh, if I had more time, I, I would. I wish I could. X5 camera, is it better to use D-Log or none? The X5 camera is better to use D-Log. The X5 camera, its capability of shooting D-Log is, is more like true D-Log. You know, D logarithmic uh, footage, there is detail there, there is tons of information there, especially the raw version of the X5. Let's see, uh, Drone NH says, Do you edit differently for every scene in a video or a, sing <coughs> or a single video edit for all the video? Um, I, it just depends on, on, on the shot, uh, Drone HN. It, it, it's, um, it's a matter of, of what I'm trying to say with the piece. Um, if, it's, if it's fast and, and quick moving, then you, you bet you I edit a lot differently, a much more fast pace as far as the way I shoot. Uh, I try to get a myriad of shots for that piece, and when I say a myriad, I mean things that are really close up and close to the ground and kind of slow and easy, way high up. I like point of view shots. I like to take shots that start out real close and then pull back and ramp the shot so it speeds up and then slows back in, you know, and vice versa. I hope that answers your question. How do you handle a future H.265 uh, codec with Inspire and Final Cut Pro? Drone ad service, I, that's a good question. Uh, Apple needs to kind of, uh, and since I'm on Apple, I'm on a Mac, Apple needs to make that a little bit more friendly because um, right now I know the best solution for that is to take that H.265 footage and re-encode re it to uh, pr uh, ProRes. I think from, what I, from my understanding, most folks are getting best results having to do it that way, which is... That's, that's kind of no fun because the 265 should have a little bit better quality than 264. That's the point. Um, so it, it kind of defeats the purpose, though ProRes is an extremely, extremely professional high bit rate uh, encoding. So it, it should balance out, but what third-party apps do you use? Uh, I don't use any third-party apps. I stick with the, with the Go app because I think it's made for the Phantom. Um, and, and I just trust it more. Uh, see, Paul says, any more news on the Phantom 4 Pro camera use issue? Uh, yeah, there has been. Um, I have sent two messages to DJI, and I have gotten the automated response that just says, thank you, you know, for sending us this message, and your, your information is important to us. But no one's, no one's gotten back to me. I know that on the forums, though, the fellow that I reference, Raptor Man, uh, has received word and apparently at least this is what they say on the forums our engineers are looking at it and are working on a solution that will be fixed in the next firmware update so I don't know but you know what at least they're talking about it at least people are aware of it and at least DJI is aware of it I know for a fact that the video that I made was presented uh, to uh, DJI corporate in China and they did see the video so we'll see uh, Ken, I'm located in Louisville, Kentucky. Let's see. Hey, Denmark. Hey, Tim. Hey, Andrew. Good to hear. Andrew says, I have to say cheers for previous advice. I'm still crashing, but doing it so much better now. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Roman, I don't know why they removed the art style in, in the Mavic uh, Pro. I have no idea. It was, it was a good profile. I think some of the other profiles, the film profiles, are close to what art was. But, um, you know, quite honestly, it is frustrating when they release something and you kind of get a good feeling for a setting you like, and all of a sudden they change it and remove it and then add other ones. Uh, but my humble opinion of that is that they turn these things out so fast that um, they don't do enough testing on on what the final settings should be and what the copter should offer and that kind of thing so when they release it they they kind of we all end up doing the testing for them uh, i'm not trying to be negative any kind of way but it is what it is you know they don't you don't release something have some great profiles and, and work through it and figure something out and then all of a sudden the new firmware wipes it away and introduces a bunch of new ones you know so i think they're they're trying their best and they're trying to work it out so Jonathan asks, is, is speed grade that much better than color correction tools in Premiere? Jonathan, the honest answer to that is speed grade is a fantastic application for color correction only. 
but speed grade is a little bit clunky and the u uh, speed grade users or I, th I believe are kind of dropping to the wayside because there hasn't been really any upgrades uh, for speed grade in a while and that's when Lumetri was introduced in Premiere Pro so they can incorporate some of those um, color correction tools within Premiere Pro because I feel confident in saying that a lot of people, most people weren't using speed grade. It had a lot of problems too. I tried to boot it for three or four different variations of speed grade and it would crash. And so I think they're phasing it out. Darko asks, have you ever, have you ever had a shot that was very blurry? It happened to me recently with a P4 and I did not figure, uh, figure out why I had to add 70% sharpening. Oh, wow. D log negative two, negative two, negative two. New. Uh, the, the only time that I've had blurry shots were one when I had a uh, my uh, my copter fixed, sent it back, and they sent me a new one, and the camera was messed up. The, it just wouldn't sharpen on the on the uh, in the center. In the center, the edges were sharp. The center wasn't. But um, I don't know if um, I have no idea. That sounds like a you know a camera issue to me. Sorry, I can't be of more help with that. Hey Moscow, great to see you. JMB fifty seven five N. Why AOG says do you do you uh, so do you not use waypoint missions often? The waypoint mission planning on Leechy is invaluable for the kind of shots uh, I go for to me anyway. Yeah, I mean I know there are some folks that really like waypoints, um, but I sim the reason I don't is I simply like the control that I have over the copter if I want to make a change or need to make a change to the flight. So. That's kind of why I stick with it. I, I, you know, from what I've never heard a bad thing about uh, lychee, but um, that's I guess just a personal preference. James Murphy wants to know: Would you would you try and plan in your head all the shots you'd like to achieve, then pursue, or just wing it and see what the day brings? I have to just I have to purchase the Mavic, by the way, and I'm planning on. Uh, I always shots. I always plan the shots. You know, uh, I go out with a list of shots. I go out to get those shots, uh, but then I always wing it. You know, after the fact, I'll. What will happen is you'll plan a shot. You'll have your list of shots, and then you'll get in a location. And because of the lighting and and what's going on in the environment that you're in, you'll see something that's fantastic, and you'll you'll capture that. So yeah, I've, I've definitely got a, a a list of shots that I plan, but I always keep keep it very flexible because you never know what you're going to see hey Ari from Finland do you have a video with the best camera settings for the Mavic yes Caesar, I do check out my channel uh, I just posted one two days ago I think uh, with my help from my friend here that's on uh, Brad Buskey he's um, he's helped me out in putting that video together and doing the test so yes there's a video there if you just go look in my um, in my playlists Aerial uh, air photography, air photography. By the way, I really appreciate your expertise and the time you take. Oh, I pff, no problem. I appreciate you guys. I wouldn't be I wouldn't be anything without you guys. So, um, any thoughts on grading footage from a P4 and Canon DSLR and trying to make them match? Yes, Jonathan. Lots of thoughts on on that, and 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 primarily that is that's a tough job to do any camera even cameras of the same make you know the uh, or model you know, not the model but uh, you know a panasonic camera and another panasonic camera oftentimes will shoot very differently um, but yeah that's all about going in there and looking at the scopes uh, while you do your color correction on each shot and seeing what the similarities are and matching each one of those um, I hope that answers the question. It, it is difficult to do, and it makes color grading even more difficult because, because you're having to match something as it goes along. So the color is consistent. That's a great question to ask because because it should be. You know, you don't want your shots to be obvious. Um, it's obvious that you've used another camera, but you don't want the look of the shot to be obviously different. You, you want to have synergy in the look and feel of the edit. So, Okay. Let's see. Airtography says struggling with de uh, deciding between using 1080 or higher 2 and 4K resolutions when uh, YouTube and, Vim and Vimeo and net bandwidth don't yet support the bandwidth needed. Your suggestions. Um, always shoot in 4K. And here's why. I edit on a 1080 timeline always. I rarely do a 4K timeline edit. But with 4K footage, the beauty of that is 4K, you know, 1080, and I'm looking at the size of my screen here, 1080 is about from here 
to here compared to 4K. So what that means is when you use 4K footage, drop it in your 1080 timeline and you can enlarge that footage. Let's say you want to cut something out of your shot that's, that, that's not really appease, uh, appealing to the composition. With 4K footage, you can enlarge that almost 200% and you're still at 1080 HD resolution. So that's the reason I always shoot in 4K so I have that wiggle room and leeway. You know, even if I'm doing a shot that's static, with 4K footage, I can I can almost fake a, a, a dolly push, you know, or a slight side move it by enlarging that footage and keyframing that to move a little bit within the shot. So 4K, even though I don't upload 4K videos either, I always shoot in 4K so I have that extra wiggle room and resolution because even if I don't enlarge it, with 4K footage on a 1080 timeline, you've got double the amount of information and detail, which in theory will give you a little bit better looking 1080 video. No, Ari, I, I haven't done any um, grading tutorials with Final Cut Pro. I, you know, I stick with Premiere Pro, but I try to use tools that are universal. You know, scopes and and uh, and basic color correction tools that that are universal within any application that you use. So hopefully, hopefully that helps. But no, I, I, I kind of like Premiere Pro and stick with that because I just don't have the time to, <laughs> to learn other stuff. I am, uh, see, Chris Watkins says, I am new to editing, currently using iMovie. Which editing software do you recommend for a beginner like me? I have an iMac and a DJI Mavic. Chris, um, you don't need any sophisticated editing software. You don't. Anybody that's listening to this right now, you do not need uh, a high-end editing software. Editing Real editing and true editing and storytelling comes down to simple cuts. That's it. No crazy transitions, no cute, you know, uh, flashy uh, dissolves and things like that. It's all about the cut, a clean cut, in and out, and, and when you cut, and when you cut in, how long you hang on a shot, how long you let that play out. Even a dissolve I use uh, very sparingly. You know, so iMovie is a great application to start cutting and editing in. Um, Ninety percent of the videos that I do that you've seen on my channel could have all been done in iMovie. So just because you're using iMovie does not mean you are going to get less professional results. You know, the editing application doesn't make you an editor. You are the editor, you know. So it's all about simplicity and clean cuts. I hope that answers the question. When exporting from Premiere, uh, what format do you recommend for YouTube? Uh, Drone HN, look on my channel. I've got a video called Best Export Settings for YouTube, so that'll walk you through how to do that. Uh, but I always export as an MP4. YouTube really likes MP4s uh, at a constant bit rate of 50 megabits per second. So check that video out. That'll explain that for you. Why AOG says, I consider myself an expert at Vegas Pro and I can do virtually anything that can be done in Premiere uh, in Vegas. What other advantage would, be, would there be to getting more familiar with Premiere? You know, I can't really say there are massive advantages to switching. If you're, if you're proficient in Vegas, stick with it. You know, stick with what you know, because it's all about simplicity. It's all about uh, the perfect cut at the perfect time with not a lot of tricks and, and, and kind of goofy, silly bells and whistles to your footage to make it professional. Um, I stick with Premiere Pro because I, I like the way it feels. I like the way it handles footage, and I like the way it, it interacts with other Adobe apps because I use Photoshop a lot, and I use After Effects. You know, like the intro to, to my videos where it's this uh, talking out loud with the, the sparkles and that stuff, that was done in After Effects. So it talks, you know, back and forth to other Adobe apps well, so I, I just kind of stick with it. But, but um, Vegas is great. If, you, if you're comfortable with that, man, stick with it. Yep, Power Director is easy to use, so agree with the minimal fancy stuff. Yep. Jonathan Scruggs says, do you have a go-to place for music? Do you compose it, etc.? How do you decide what type of music a video needs? Uh, number one... In a pinch, I use audio blocks simply because it's super affordable. Uh, I think it's like, I don't know, $50, $99 a year for unlimited downloads. Audio blocks is great. If I want something that is a little more specific uh, and I don't have time, I use uh, Premium Beat. Now, that's more expensive per track, but great music. Uh, but other than that, I do compose my own music for 90% of my videos. I use Logic Pro 10. Uh, I was a musician and, a, and a, uh, a music composer long before I started video editing, so I kind of like to do that anyway because that, that way I know that I'm assured that no 
other videos out there will have the same kind of music, you know, in, in the background, so it would be proprietary to my, uh, my videos. Ben Ryan says, a good audio soundtrack is half the job. How do you choose the audio track for the background of your videos? Do you use free or paid music? Okay, I think I just answered that with the audio blocks uh, uh, comment or my own music. Um, but choosing the music, that's, uh, that's a great question because uh, in a couple of my videos I've addressed this. Um, music is often the afterthought. And, and it just can't be that. Music is everything in your edits. It's everything. It is the sound that will make or break that video. So what kind of music? It depends on the mood. You know, it depends on what you're trying to express. You know, if you're trying to show something that is heartwarming and gentle, then I, then I choose music that has that feeling. If I'm trying to show something that is energized and exciting, same for the music. So I hope that answers the question. Hey, Bobster. Yeah, you didn't miss anything. You're here. Thanks for the tutorials from Tim. You're welcome, Tim. Thank you. Larry says, Hi, Frederick. Thanks for the great information in your videos. I bought P4P Plus, my first drone. Had to return it because the screen was defective out of the box. Man, I am sorry about that, Larry. Hmm. Larry says, What are the most important things for a brand new Phantom Flyer to do and learn <clears throat> how to fly? The most important thing is to know that thing inside and out. Don't be overzealous. Don't skip take shortcuts learn everything about that bird how to uh, how to set it up how to how to watch your batteries your cell voltage how to uh, understand all the features like re return to home your return to home altitude uh, learn how to fly in full addy mode in case you ever have a problem the, uh, really the best thing is to take your time don't be overzealous about it and and I'm not preaching here <laughs> I'm speaking from experience because I've done that my first bird I got out and threw it out in the backyard and took off and I ran into a pine tree you know that was like uh, 28 seconds and and boom it was done I didn't kill the copter but it was because I was overzealous and and was excited you know went out and took off without doing the homework and, 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 and studying up a little bit. And, and, you know, that's what happened for me. So take your time and um, learn everything about that copter. Uh, it's, it's easy for those things to get away from you. I'm a guy who does everything by the book, literally every flight compass calibration no matter if it's the same location that day as yesterday or whatever, but every flight I do it by the book and I have ran into trees. It happens. So, Careful, careful, careful. Any planned projects in the future? Anything you could bring us along? Live stream? Uh, Brad, the, the the one project I'm trying to get together is my friend uh, Kevin Bryan that flies the two octocopters with red epic cameras and um, and the X-Quad and two Inspires, and he's got all this equipment. He's, he's a pro. This is the guy that travels all around the world doing aerial videography. Uh, he's, he told me he would love for me to come over and, and interview him and show his setup and show his, his quads and octocopters and cameras. I mean, his octocopter with the Red Epic hanging from it is about $73,000 worth of stuff. So that's, that's, that's a project I'd like to do, but he's, he's busy. He's out of town a lot, so I'm still working with him to set that up. Yeah, travels with you. Stay away from trees. Yeah, trees are the worst. I think every... Other than when my Phantom just malfunctioned and fell out of the sky. Literally fell out of the sky after uh, 206 flights. Other than that, every crash, which is like four... Um, every single crash I had has been me and trees. So, Chris Watkins says, are your videos anywhere online? Not the tutorials, but your full videos. Of the actual broadcast, uh, you're talking about my work or my reel. Um, I do not have those online, but a lot of the work that um, I have done is uh, on my uh, company's website, Bandy Carol Hellage. Uh, that's bch.com. Um, a lot of the TV and broadcast work is there, and, and I leave it there because just out of, out of doing the right thing and, 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 and fairness, those are, those are, those are copyright protected uh, of Bandy Carroll Hollage, the company I work for, and I don't think that would be real fair if I started posting TV spots on my web channel um, showing that kind of work. I think, I think that it's, it would be more kosher for me to have, that, have them have that. But, but that being said, I'm going to post, uh, put together, I've been collecting my, my work, and I'm going to put together a reel uh, of footage, I think, at some point, because I'm going to start showing a little bit more advanced techniques with videography and filming and editing. A lot of the stuff I do is pretty pretty basic to intermediate stuff, I think, so it's just to get people 
get 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 your feet wet and start enjoying uh, doing your own editing. But I think I'm going to start doing some more intermediate stuff. So when I do that, I need to show examples of of those kind of shots, and that's the way I'm going to do that using TV spots and cinema stuff that I've already done. Um, Travels with Yolo says, "What are you going to do with the videos people sent uh, to you with questions?" I have a problem with that because there's only been two people that have sent a video. You know, I think uh, you live and learn, and I think folks are kind of uncomfortable, apparently, about, you know, recording themselves on video, then having that question in the video. Uh, don't don't really feel comfortable doing that, and I totally understand that. So I've not had enough, <laughs> I've not had enough response to really put together a video, so I don't know if that's, that one's going to happen or not. I got into color grading, Ray, um, about uh, nine years ago, nine, ten years ago when I started editing, uh, just because I, I come from an art direction by background in advertising, which I know Photoshop like the back of my hand, so it was an easy kind of jump for me to want to be able to color the footage and film that I shoot. Uh, so about, uh, you know, about, about nine years ago or so, I got into it just because I, I, made, a, I made a decision to start to learn how to cut and edit footage after I've been doing TV um, for, you know, 15, 20 years up to that point. And uh, I wanted to be the guy behind the camera and behind the uh, editing station and, and to do this on my own because I just love it. So well, let's see. Uh, Ray says, I think I'm thinking of starting my own business in editing and color grading. What advice would you give? Um, I would, the best advice is patience, you know, and be willing to work with other people. You know, um, I always had this romantic thought of what I do for a living, right? You know, I shoot video for an advertising agency and I art direct shoots and then I edit and color grade. Um, but there are a lot of cooks in the kitchen, if you know what I mean. It's not just me. I'd like to be, I would like to be the sole chef, you know, making the stew. That is not the way things work and that's okay. You know, that's okay. So you've really got to be uh, open to uh, criticism, have some tough skin. But uh, you've got to be able to compromise and work with, with other people. That will get you farther than anything. Being able to listen to someone and hear what they're trying to, to tell you, hear what they're trying to relay to you uh, and what their goal is, what they're trying to accomplish, and then you coming back to them with a solution to that. That's really what it's all about. So I hope that answers the question. Bobster, my favorite type of aerial shots are quick uh, quick and simple. As far as performing them, uh, maybe that defeats the purpose of of that of me answering that question. But my favorite aerial shots are things that have a lot of energy in them. And when I say a lot of energy in them, this is another video I'm thinking about doing. Um, I don't know how to say this without sounding uh, sounding blasphemous, uh, but I think you guys will understand where I'm coming from. Aerial video is boring. I said it. And the reason is because as a, as a consumer, as a person who watches stuff, not as an editor, once your brain sees something, it only takes a few seconds for it to register and you get it. You know, I'm completely guilty of this. My early videos, I've got, you know, eight minutes of just flying over stuff. Okay, that's fine. But what makes it exciting is, is, is to get to the cut quick and get out quick. So I think the best cut, my favorite shots that I like to do is take a nice long shot, like a point of view shot where I'm rotating around something for 20 seconds, you know, which is way too long to hang on a shot. I like to start that shot, ramp the speed up and then ramp back down, you know, so I start really fast and then ramp up and then stop and slow down and then cut and out. Th those are the best kind of shots. I hope this is answering the question, but it's always better to leave people wanting more, okay, than to overload them with way too much where you've, where you've made them lose interest, you know, and, and they become bored and they just kind of want to move on. So it's always about quick, clean, fast cuts that are appropriate to the story. Let's see. Brad, right now my storage uh, and back at workflow for my personal projects are um, a total of... 12 terabytes of hard drives. I've got three or four hard drives that are all rated together to my computer um, that totals at about 12 terabytes. So I've just got a ton of footage that I organize by each project and each job and date so I can go back and find them. So 
I don't there's no I don't have any real scientific way of doing it this that's what works best for me but you man as you all you guys probably know if you're doing video you have to have space somewhere because especially 4k video is huge Willie Freden says Fredrick I'm starting uh, I'm a startup drone company based here in Orlando how do you find clients in a society that has been programmed to fear drones um, that's a great question Willie it really is um, you have to have you have to find clients that uh, their product is appropriate to drones so that's agriculture that's real estate you know and as far as as far as uh, kind of dispelling the myth and the fear of drones that's up to you you know and that's up to me you know when I'm out flying somewhere and a person walks up to me and and you know those kind of people they have that look on their face like is that a drone you know invite them you know invite them over show them what you're doing take away the magic take away the fear from it show them you're not spying you're not you know doing anything that's malicious you're simply capturing a video hopefully in a place that is legal to capture <laughs> you know there are places that you know you know uh, where you shouldn't be flying and, and where you should be um, and of course with any business uh, especially nowadays if you're in the states uh, make sure you have your 107 uh, part 107 taken and passed uh, so every, everything's legit and legal and nobody gets in any trouble Okay, I'm just kind of scrolling here to make sure I didn't miss anything. Okay, we've been going for about 38 minutes. Again, guys, let me know what you uh, what you want to hear talk about. Uh, and if this is getting like super boring, you know, I could uh, I got tough skin. I can take it. Just let me know. <laughs> Jonathan, you're asking how did you go about getting your license? I don't know if you're asking me or maybe Bobster. I don't have have mine yet. I, I, I tend to hire a lot of the work that I need for my corporate clients. Um, I hire folks that have the license and, and, and are good to go, so I don't do that, but maybe Bob could, could chime in there. Ari says, I've noticed that flying a drone is like playing solitaire. You start with nobody in sight, but after uh, a while, you have somebody behind your back either asking questions or giving advice. Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of the way it goes. Hey, Matteo. Uh, when I shoot in my car, it's one of two things. It's either my GH4, uh, Lumix GH4, or it's my GoPro Hero 4 mounted to the uh, mounted to the windshield with a with a suction cup. What is the cost for you to hire in drone work? Um, it depends on the shot, and, and it depends on the bird that I hire. If I hire someone uh, to shoot with a Phantom 4 Pro slash Inspire kind of bird and it, when I say Inspire I mean not the Inspire X5 camera or the X5R camera but just that level of uh, Phantom 4 Pro quality or Inspire um, X3 quality uh, that's $750 a day a day constitutes six to eight hours um, if it's something that requires much higher end and much better footage for example an octocopter flying a, a red epic camera or a red dragon um, that cost is $2,700 a day. Uh, that's kind of a rough ballpark to give you for, for what people charge for those and, and get paid for those. You know, people can charge whatever they want, but what can you get paid? Uh, so that's, that's, I hope that's a rough ballpark to kind of give you, give you an idea. Okay, travel back to the idea of editing 4K to export in 1080. Other than cropping and panning each clip, is there any improvement overall in the image quality once rendered to 1080? Um, in my opinion, yes, there is uh, travels with Yoli. I, I think that the image is a little cleaner, even though you're still exporting out at 1080. 4K footage on a 1080 timeline has more detail in it. It really does. So, in theory, um, you're rendering out with more information to add to that render than 1080 footage rendering a 1080 render on a 1080 timeline, if that makes sense. Where do you find music style for the videos? Commonly, it's electric hip hop beats. Uh, yeah, Chris, I, I, I kind of addressed that earlier, so I won't go into too much detail uh, for folks that have already heard it. But I, 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 I uh, compose my own music for things, and I compose for the sound of the video. And if not, I use audio blocks or premium beats to download uh, royalty-free music beds or buy them. Uh, but audio blocks is much cheaper, so I tend to use them first. So, capturing audio in the car, I use uh, the Rode VideoMic Pro. That's a fantastic uh, shotgun microphone. It's got a, a, a high-pass filter on it too that cuts out all the low, rumbly noises of a car. So that that uh, the VideoMic Pro by Rode is is fantastic for DSLR. 
Roman says, where uh, are you grabbing the extra time for your editing um, and shooting videos? Time is exonerable. Yeah, it, it is, Roman. I mean, <laughs> I do. I usually do the videos that I do uh, after work. You know, after I've had a, already had an eight-hour day, uh, I'll run out and, and maybe shoot video during the day and then come home, grab something to eat, and um, and then start editing so yeah it takes anywhere from about six hours to 18 hours to do one of my videos depending on you know what's covered and if it's location shoots and stuff like that so yeah it is it is it's a lot of work but it, it's very rewarding especially because of you guys so good minimum encoding bit rate for h264 1080p without noticeable artifacts minimum would be about 30 25 to 30 megabits per second but that is set to cbr do not use the uh gosh what's it called cbr is constant bit rate variable bit rate that's what i was trying to think of don't use variable bit rate variable bit rate will make a decision to where it's going to drop the bit rate down because there's not enough going on in the scene detail wise stuff like that use a constant bit rate but if you're if you're at a constant bit rate render at 25 to 30 um, megabits per second that's plenty and you won't see a lot of loss there obviously it's best to render out the same bit rate that it was shot in you know so if something was shot like the Phantom 3 Pro shoots at 60 megabits per second so my renders uh, for those videos are, are at 50 just a little bit less but that keeps the file down uh, for the Phantom 4 Pro that it's 100 megabits per second I would up my render uh, to maybe 80 megabits per second so it kind of meets that and that, that reassures that I won't lose a lot of quality sorry I kind of rambled on that one I hope that answered it yeah recording uh, Ray says he records at 2.7 then renders in 1080 that's great yeah Bobster, I charge $150 per hour with my P3P. Yeah, that's a, that's a, a I think, I don't even know if that's addressed to me. I think that's a, a very fair price and, uh, and, and a, a, you know, a good price at where, where you're going to get paid for that kind of price, but it's still, uh, you're not wasting your time for sure. Dan says, uh, Frederick, I pulled the trigger and ordered the P4P. Looking forward to working with the camera for some of my professional shots. We'll keep you updated on the issues uh, if they're uncovered. Thanks, Dan. I appreciate it. Michael Drones, Michigan Drones, VBR makes things look really bad in some instances. I don't know how, I don't know how to address that because VBR, I'm sorry, back up. Yes, it does make things look bad in some instances. I was confused. I was thinking of CBR. And the reason that it does that is because it's a variable bitrate. It drops, it'll make it make a call on, well, there's not enough detail really going on in this, in this image. So I'm going to drop from 30 megabits to three. And that's why all of a sudden the video will shift and it'll have artifacting and these little uh, macro macro blobs and things like that. And you'll see that artifacting in it. That's why that variable bitrate is dropping. So constant bitrate is, is important. Ray says, how do you render the bitrate in, in editing? Uh, that's under the settings, you, in, under the encoding settings. That's where you set that in before you hit export or render. Third Gorilla, what ND filters do you use? Uh, the ND filter that I use the most is the ND8. That one is right in right in the middle of, of super bright days or super dark days, but an ND16 is really handy for, for when it's like full sunshine at noon. Uh, the most useful ND filter I have is the Snake River prototyping ND filter, which is uh, uh, called the GND 16 to 8. Now, what that means is it's graduated, a very subtle graduation. So on the top of the ND filter, it's a 16, and it's, it slowly graduates to an 8 on the bottom. So that's great because 90% of our, your shots for aerials, the sky is always much brighter than the land, right? So that's, that's a great ND filter that balances out that exposure. Dan says, Frederick, we need to contact Snake River and get them to restock the graduated ND. Yes, we do. And uh, I will call uh, Snake River uh, here soon because I have some questions for them anyway and ask what's what's going on with that. So saturation, what's that? Saturation, good evening. Would you consider a tutorial covering transitions? There are many ways to do it, but uh, I value your input. Yeah, I mean, I'm going to do a tutorial pretty soon that covers just more advanced editing techniques, and transitions are definitely one of those. But real quick, 
Only use a transition if it makes sense or if there's a reason to use it. Never use a transition transition because it's cool or it's a neat effect. Uh, then it becomes a gimmick, you know? It, it just becomes a kind of a gimmicky trick and that cheapens your video. Hard, clean cuts with no transitions are the best cuts to make. You know, dissolve is next if you're going to use a transition, but a dissolve is usually great for illustrating that time has passed or you are changing the thought within the video. You know, you're going one direction and now you're changing the attitude and, and thought of the video into another direction. So a transition kind of illustrates that, but never use a transition without a good reason. What frame rate do you uh, recommend when passing through tree branches to get more fluid passing motion? 24 frames per second. I film 80% of the stuff that I do at 24 frames per second, even if it's on my quadcopter or the guy that I hire that fl flies the, uh, the, the, uh, the Red Epic. We film at 24 frames per second and a shutter speed locked in at 50 to get that beautiful cinematic uh, motion blur. Third Gorilla wants to know, what video card do you use ha and have you ever had the error of compiling a movie or in Premiere? I've been getting that error a lot lately with editing with mixed video types. Yes, I do get that error. Uh, I have a GTX uh, 680 4GB uh, VRAM graphics card, so it's a pretty decent card. It's not the best decent card, uh, or it's not the best card. Uh, and I, I get that error from time to time too when I've got way too much stuff going on, especially if it's a bunch of footage from a bunch of different cameras that are in different formats, AVC, HD, MOV, MP4, you know, Premiere has a tendency to kind of go, ah, and, you know, just fall apart and then I have to reboot. But usually restart freshens things up and, and clears the cache out where I can, where I can, you know, finish out the project. Andrew asks, when would you use a polarizing filter? I don't use them, Andrew. Uh, I kind of went over this in the, the last um, live feed that I did, but I don't use polarizers really quick because polarizers are only effective at 90 degrees, okay, from your shooting angle. So if I'm shooting this way, a polarizer's effect is only, only active if the sun is coming from here or the sun is coming from here. You know, if the sun's from here or here, has no effect at all. And the quad moves so much, that getting that sweet spot is very, very difficult to maintain. So polarizers are great for photography because the camera's going to be like right there in that one direction. But for video, I don't use them. Uh, plus, I, I do my uh, my uh, my changes and and grading in, in Premiere after the fact, so I can really you know oversaturate stuff and, and and spice it up if I need to. Ray says, "What would your biggest tip in editing and color grading you have learned within your editing and color grading career?" Uh, that's a big question, uh, and I mentioned this in one of my videos, and 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 I'll say it again, uh, and it's very crude, so I'm not trying to be crude here, but don't be afraid to suck. Uh, you're going to. This isn't easy, and um, you have to learn. Nothing that I have ever taken on that I've never done before that I'm I'm taking on something new. I've never knocked that out of the park right out of the gate. Um, and the challenge is not being discouraged, you know, and not giving up. Keep going, you know, just keep trying and learn from every experience that you have. That's that's kind of the best advice I can give because that's a big question. It's a good question, but it's that's a question I could talk about for 30 minutes. So that's the best I can do with that one. Uh, let's see. Larry says 24 frames per second then is the reason I see my many phantom videos that do not have smooth, smooth motion. I thought the smoothest video is 60 frames per second, give you the smoothest results. Um, it, it, kind of, it, the reason 24 frames is, is in quote smoother, the caveat to that is your, your, your shutter speed has to be at 50. The rule of thumb is your shutter speed should be double your frame rate, no higher. So if, you're, if your shutter speed's at 50 at 24 frames per second, fast movement will have motion blur in it that blends it and smooths it all together. 60 frames per second, many more frames per second than 24, will, there's not enough time to have that motion blur. So 60 frames per second, this is hard to describe, but 60 frames per second is more for reality TV okay and shows like that that have that real smooth kind of kind of realistic video quality much different than the smoothness of cinematic smoothness with with motion blur at 24 frames per second so you know what 
it, it kind of boils down to a preference, you know? It's whatever you prefer, and, and that's all that's important anyway. But I like cinematic smoothness in motion uh, due to 24 frames per second versus 60 frames per second. Plus, you get a little bit better video quality because 24 frames per second, if you've got a certain amount of bit rate, that 24 frames per second gets all of that bit rate, where 60 frames per second also gets the same amount of bit rate, but it's divided up thinner between each frame, if that makes sense. And yes, Dan says 60 frames is best only when you want to use slow motion shots. Yes, yeah, 60 frames, again, that's great for when you want to slow something down to true 24 frames per second, especially when you're ramping videos, ramping the, the motion up or down. Do you have any tips for a, a photographer moving into videography, in particular drone videography? The biggest tip is kind of the one that, that I mentioned, James. A lot of photographers come into... Um, uh, drones and videography and they, they want to apply the rules of, of photography uh, directly across to videography and there's that one caveat shutter speed shutter speed is everything in videography and that is if you're shooting 24 frames per second you double that speed so 50 is the shutter speed you want to stay locked on to to get that nice organic fluid motion uh, motion blur in your shots where uh, photography, if your shutter's at a thousand or fifteen hundred, doesn't matter. You know, whatever whatever the proper exposure is for you know to get that shutter speed at fifteen uh, fifteen hundred is fine. But that's the thing you you, you want to make sure that that shutter speed uh, maintains a, around fifty for twenty four frames per second, so you get natural motion blur. Well, guys, I think um, I think I'm going to wrap it up. I think we've answered a lot of questions, and uh, I obviously don't want to make this too boring uh, anyway. But uh, I really appreciate your all's participation, um, and let me know too after I post this. You can post comments under it on YouTube. You know, let me know if this is if this is working. If you're learning anything, if this is fun, if you like this, and let me know if you don't like it because I certainly don't want to keep doing something that makes people go, oh, no, not another one of those. You know, <laughs> so. Um, Anyway, um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go ahead and, and, and slow things down here and, and shut down, but uh, I really appreciate your all's time, and thanks for taking time out of your day to spend with me and ask questions, and uh, hopefully we'll get together and uh, do another video, and I'll see you guys real soon. So real quick, I'll check and make sure there are no super, super questions that have come through, and it looks like we're good to go. Awesome. Happy New Year to you guys. I appreciate your support. Love you guys to death. Talk to you real soon. Bye-bye.